Look, I think there very well could be a recession, or even worse. I, I really don't know if they can engineer a soft landing or not, but I sort of agree with, uh, with Eric there that I think we do have a lot of trouble ahead. When it happens, I've, so I've told you this many times, on the short term, I don't think anybody can really predict it. I, I think there's just too many variables in this type of a market. But one thing I did learn many years ago, <laughs> you don't fight the Fed. Now the Fed, I think, pretty much has turned. And when you don't have the Fed put, that's a whole new dimension that's brought to this market. And in your heyday, <laughs> Yeah. Paul Volcker had to do what he did to crush inflation. Do you think and do you have confidence that Jay Powell is up to the task? Well, I, I think he says he is. And, and I, I think you have to do it. I don't think there's a choice. It, it, the, inflation is a terrible thing when it gets going. You can't get that genie back in the bottle too easily. We saw it in the 70s. We saw what happened. Carl Icahn. Perhaps the paradigmatic and archetypal corporate raider has come out and asserted that there's a strong possibility of a recession and that it could be very difficult for the Federal Reserve to engineer a so-called soft landing, whereby they're able to bring inflation under control while not triggering a recession. He's alluded to a few reasons for why a recession is a serious possibility, not a certainty but a strong possibility. And these include cost pressures and their impact on growth due to ongoing supply pressures, but also the Russo-Ukraine war. In addition to this, just the generally bad state of corporate America and the lack of accountability. You've also got the pressures on property and the retail sector due to the ongoing nature of work from home, which is asserted is going to continue to put pressure on some sectors of the economy, amongst other reasons for why a recession is a serious risk for the economy going forward. I'm going to go through what he is saying and whether or not it makes any sense. Now, my name's Mark. Welcome back to the channel. If you have any thoughts about what Carl Icahn is saying, I would be interested to hear that in the comments below. And of course, it would be great if you like the channel and subscribe to the video or the other way around. In any case, thanks a lot for watching, and let's have a look at what Carl Icahn is saying. Let's first focus on the direct impact of interest rates going up, because that clearly is going to be front and center of many people's minds. Carl Icahn was actually relatively silent about the direct impact of interest rates. However, it was clear from his comments that he would believe that this is going to be a damper on growth. And that's unsurprising, because interest rates going up is to try to cool the economy. It's to try to get a handle on inflation. But it is going to impact growth, unsurprisingly. Inflation is way too high, even according to the Federal Reserve. CPI growth was 7.9% in the latest readout. PCE, which is their preferred measure of inflation, was 5.2% year on year, again above their target range. So potentially we're going to see seven interest rate increases throughout 2022 potentially also involving 50 basis point hikes, which the Federal Reserve has signaled a greater willingness to engage in. So we're going to see more interest rate hikes. There's a few things we need to bear in mind. First, the Federal Reserve does not have a great history of ensuring a so-called soft landing. That is, an increase in interest rates without causing a recession. Various commentators and analysts have expressed this rather publicly. I think like, uh, the, the Fed does not have a very good history of engineering a soft landing. Yeah. And I think the hope is that this time is different. And, and Carl Icahn appears to believe the same thing. So a soft landing appears to be rather difficult to achieve, and the Federal Reserve doesn't have the best history in trying to achieve this. The next thing is the Federal Reserve is going to need to balance a recession versus inflation. It's going to be incredibly difficult for them to avoid that. And various analysts have also mentioned this. There's going to be a balancing act between the recession and inflation, because increasing interest rates or doing quantitative tightening will adversely affect growth. It's credibility eroded. The central bank appears to have a choice between risking a recession or prolonging inflation. Mohammed goes on to say the Fed is increasingly being forced to consider those two things 
which policy mistake it wishes to be remembered for, meeting its inflation target by causing a recession or allowing high and potentially destabilizing inflation to persist well into 2023. I'm pleased to say Mohammed can speak for himself when he joins us now. Mohammed, do you think it's that binary, one or the other? I do, and I'm really worried about it, John. The question is, to what extent can they really rein in inflation without causing that to be the case? And to some extent, inflation will be slightly temporary due to supply chain factors. However, that's only a part of inflation. And the longer it goes on, the greater the risk of a wage spiral, which is going to cause a continual spiral upwards in inflation as wages go up. The next thing that we'd want to note is the Federal Reserve has notably lost credibility, according to some analysts, i.e. by virtue of the fact that they were so wrong in 2021, and by virtue of the fact that they failed to articulate what they would do differently and why it is they made the mistake in 2021, and why it is their models now are better models for the current environment, the failure to articulate what they're doing differently does not give terribly much confidence about the Federal Reserve. Are you suggesting that the chairman and his words have lost credibility with some market participants? So what I'm suggesting, John, will come as no surprise to you because I've been saying it for a while. They've lost credibility when it comes to inflation fighting. They've lost credibility in terms of their ability to forecast inflation. And they've lost control of their policy narrative. And that's why you're seeing this volatility in the marketplace every time we hear something from Chair Powell. Next, this gives rise to the risk of stagflation. Now, I'll talk a little bit about some other factors that will influence this in a second. And again, it's been noted that across various countries, there's a greater risk of a recession and or that stagflationary impulse going on. I don't think the market has factored in yet what's going to happen to the economy as all these changes start transmitting through the economy. So we are yet to see my baseline for what it's worth is that we're going to see a global stagflation, lower growth, higher inflation. Within that, we're going to see depression in Russia and Ukraine. We're going to see a recession in Europe. We're going to see stagflation in the US. And we're going to see a number of commodity importing developing countries running into debt problems. That's the sort of world we're looking at, given the shocks we're taking. The next thing we need to bear in mind is the yield curve. And the yield curve is very weakly inverted at the moment. Now, when you get an inverted yield curve, it signals that the market believes there is potentially going to be a recession and the Federal Reserve will need to readjust rates downwards in the future. Let's now dig a little bit deeper into supply chain problems and the issues that those might create, both for inflation and for growth. We have with the supply chain problems and because our companies are so badly run, with many exceptions, we really don't have that supply. In, in the last 20 or 30 years, you, you, you had this, uh, through the 80s and 90s, you had cheap goods coming in from from the Far East, from China for sure, and and even from Russia. You, 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 so you got that great advantage for our society. People would take the dollar. And people would use that. And so all these countries wanted the Yankee dollar. And as a result, you, you really had cheap goods. And I think those days are over now. And um, I, as I, you have, and you have this uh, war going on now, which adds another problem to your inflationary picture. So, so Carl Icahn has asserted that supply chain issues are going to cause cost pressures to last for longer. Christian Muller Glissman, a managing director at Goldman Sachs, had also indicated a similar point, highlighting that these supply chain disruptions can be somewhat akin to deglobalization, and this ultimately could result in both A, higher prices, and B, potentially lower growth due to the fact that the companies are no longer able to get access to relatively cheaper goods, and or consumers are no longer able to get access to relatively cheaper goods, which ultimately can reduce their ability to go out and spend and invest. Yeah, I think it sounds um, like it should be inflationary because at the margin, you know, um, you have reshoring um, um, of uh, supply chains. You have less ability to essentially take the best of the global economy to make your company um, uh, produce the, the cheapest, um, best products. No? 
This has two underlying implications that he is not specifically stated, but obviously inherent in what Karl Icahn is saying. First, inflation is likely to remain more difficult and more stubborn to get under control than maybe the Federal Reserve is anticipating. And this, to some extent, is inherent in the dot plot, which goes through the various members of the FMOC's views about what should happen to interest rates, with some outliers thinking that there should have been a 50 basis point hike in March, suggesting that cost pressures are really going to remain higher for longer. Secondly, this could impact growth. This is not something that Carl Icahn directly alluded to, but it is quite clear that if various goods remain more expensive for longer, this could clearly impact both corporate growth and also individual consumers as they buy less in order to try to conserve money. Now, while some individuals have asserted that you could run down savings, to my mind, that is problematic, to use a hackneyed term. Firstly, there's the inherent issue of just asserting people should run down their savings. That is really quite stupid because you're basically saying, well, people should be happy to just go backwards. That's the first thing. Secondly, I would assert that consumers have a degree of bifurcation, i.e. some people after COVID did really quite well and a whole lot of people got smashed. And those people who got smashed aren't going to be in a position to just run down their savings. So I think looking at average savings for individuals in society is really just too blunt and too naive. So I would agree with the assertion or the implication that these ongoing cost pressures could easily exacerbate the risk of a recession going forward, at least if that is what Carl Icahn is implying, and it appears to some extent he is. What about the impact of the investor mix? Does it make a difference if we've got more investors who have relatively less experience in the financial markets? And how might the losses that they might accrue, and in particular their inability to stomach some of those losses, impact the market and potentially broader economic growth? Carl Icahn also specifically addresses that. And you have a lot of people in this market, a tremendous amount, more than I've ever seen, that have no idea what they're doing. I mean, it, you know, the, the market is not a gambling casino completely. It, it, there, is, there, are, there are people in this market that do have an edge. And, and you have so many people out there that really are gambling. Carl Icahn has also alluded to the idea here that retail investors could be worsening the economic climate. Now, clearly, this is not per se going to directly weigh on growth. Rather, the way this would really impact things is it's going to exacerbate the impact of a rough landing rather than a soft landing. And it will, of course, run down some consumers' uh, disposable income because they're losing it on so-called investments. So he is right that retail investors have gained some prominence, particularly in the post-Wall Street bets era, and that many retail investors are not necessarily very experienced or skilled. I don't necessarily agree with him that they don't know what they're doing, because investors start off maybe not being that skilled, but they pick up skills over time and get better. So I don't think it's correct to generalize every non-professional investor as not being very good. Because there are many professional investors, and he's also a certain many CEOs, that are really not up to the task. And some retail investors will outperform professional investors. And this would be even more the case if those retail investors had access to the resources and trading platforms that those instos do. And in many cases, financial advisors, and I don't want to tar all financial advisors with the same brush, but many of them are plainly rubbish and plainly should not be providing financial advice. What about changing workplace behavior, and in particular how frequently people are in offices, and how this could affect the property sector, but also potentially some of the other retailers within the city, and how this could have an onflow effect to particular asset classes 
and potentially to growth. He has asserted this would have a more negative impact, but of course there could hypothetically be some productivity gains. However, it does remain to be seen how this plays out in the long term. You, you don't have people going to offices all the time anymore, obviously. And um, I think that is going to militate against the real estate area, perhaps. Carl Icahn has also asserted that there are ongoing work from home related issues, which he was most interested in the impact this would have on the property sector, but also, of course, it would inherently have an issue on the retail sector, and then some issues with growth as this is unused buildings, which affects landlords or commercial property companies, etc., etc. There's a supply chain issue in, in, in essence. So he's asserting that could be weighing on growth. I think that will be a bit of a weight, but we're already seeing a lot of companies trying to resume people going into the office, even if it's a few days a week. I think it will weigh on growth to some extent in some sectors, but not in all sectors. So some sectors will benefit from this, some sectors won't, some corporations will be able to reduce costs. I think it's not obvious that this work from home move is inherently bad for growth. There can be some productivity benefits, but I'm also not so super bullish on it actually yielding much productivity gain because people are generally feeling fatigue working from home. Work from home sometimes just becomes work all the time, particularly if you're in a professional job. So I think that there's limits to really how long the work from home issue is going to pursue. I mean, outside of the US, it's maybe going on longer than it is in the US, but I don't think we should overstate the impact of that. But it is something that is still relevant in the back of people's minds. Carl Icahn also asserts that an underlying problem with many corporations is that they have low quality managers. And these low quality managers are going to be unable to meet the challenges that are coming up, including high inflation and potentially lower growth. And these managers have become more and more entrenched, even though they should in an ideal world, at least according to him, be removed from their jobs. These managers exacerbate the headwinds that many corporations are going to face. But when you get to understand what these boards do, the system, the system is needing fixing. They're really, uh, there's no accountability in corporate America. You have some very fine companies and some very fine CEOs, but far too many that are not up to the task that I think is going to be necessitated. Like, for instance, now we're in a, a fight for uh, SWX. It's a utility. Southwest That's utility. South, uh, Southwestern Gas. And, and you've been... You've been embroiled in a pretty good battle with them. The, the latest news, of course, is, is you raising your tender to 8250 yeah. uh, from 75. They say they'll review it. Do you have any indication <laughs> yeah. of whether they'll accept it? Yeah, I, I, I don't think they will. But, you know, that's the question. They're the quintessential example of what's uh, wrong in corporate America. I mean, you, you really don't have accountability. I mean, here's a company that... Uh, has for seven years since this guy has been CEO, the company is only up, uh, t uh, I guess, 10 percent. Well, its peers are up 40 or 50 percent of the stocks. But worse than that, they, uh, they, they really, the agenda in that company, and, and, and many, in fact, is they're not on the same incentive program as a shareholder. And uh, they, they, in fact, own the, they and the board, uh, Hester and the board own very little stock. We think the stock is worth, you know, uh, uh, from 114 to 160, something in that in, in that area. And um, yeah, uh, uh, so the problem you have there is very literally just poor management. I, I mean, the, the, one asset there is if you got the management out of there and stopped. Uh, empire building, you would get a much better uh, return in the market. It, you, you would be able to, in a utility, in a utility, you take the rate base and you get a multiple on it in the market. And uh, in this case, the multiple is very, is, is only like 1.2. And it should be, the peer group is about 1.7. Now, that's a major move. 
So mm -hmm. this stock was selling when we bought it in the 60s. I think it's up mostly because we're there, you know, making our tender. Carl Icahn has noted that there are myriad very poor quality managers that need to be shaken out by activist investors such as himself. I absolutely agree with this. There are major issues that warrant their own discussion, but this is an area that is, I guess, directly within the wheelhouse of the type of work I do, particularly mergers and acquisitions and corporate governance. I would say there are a huge number of extremely low quality managers that particularly in the United States are so-called entrenched. Entrenched managers are managers that are difficult to fire. Entrenching a manager yields multiple problems. And Carl Icahn touched on all of these in essence. One empire building, which is basically where those managers go out and build a larger company, not in a way that creates value, but just build a larger company because then that's going to maximize their compensation and make it more difficult to fire them because they're running a larger company, so it's more difficult to acquire that firm. So empire building is a massive problem. Related to this, there is empirical evidence that managers get a job uplift and a pay rise just by doing takeovers. Their career prospects go forward or go higher just by virtue of the fact that they have done a takeover, even if that takeover was rubbish. This is a problem and it encourages empire building, even though these managers are clearly doing an awful job at it. Carl Icahn is 100% right that empire building is a very quick way and a very good way to destroy a ton of value. So he's correct to point this out as something that needs to be cut down and something that undermines value. And if managers become more and more entrenched over time and more and more difficult to remove, then value destruction is going to be exacerbated over time and growth will ultimately slow. So you do need remedies to poor quality managers either in the form of better incentive contracts to incentivize them to have an alignment with shareholders. The board needs to be better incentivized to incentivize the board to act in shareholders' best interests. Managers need to be replaceable if they're rubbish. And Carl Icahn has alluded to hostile takeovers as one way of doing this. This is 100% right and has been documented uh, forever that hostile takeovers are a good way of getting rid of awful managers. And you acquire the company and replace the managers and get an uplift. Carl Icahn has exactly alluded to the process through which this works. You've got a rubbish manager. Because there's a rubbish manager, the earnings of this company are depressed and people undervalue the company, or at least value it lower. And people realize that if you fire this manager, then you're going to create huge value. Carl Icahn then realizes this, comes in, fires the managers, creates value, rinse and repeat. Absolutely right. It is textbook market for corporate control. However, if managers are entrenched, it is much more difficult to do this. So that's the empire building aspect and the remedy to it. In addition to this, you have excess perquisite consumption. In addition to this, you have just managerial shirking, where they just fail to make money and fail to create value for shareholders because they're entrenched, they can't be replaced, and therefore they just don't care. So you see multiple problems from managerial entrenchment. Carl Icahn's pointed out all of these. And assuming that the premise is correct, the managers have become more entrenched and more difficult to replace over time. He's right that this will negatively affect growth because it will negatively affect corporate earnings and corporate innovation. So Carl Icahn is correct about this being something that will weigh on growth going forward. So those are some reasons for why Carl Icahn believes a recession is a strong possibility, albeit of course not an inevitability. These factors include, of course, the continued supply chain pressures and the impact this will have on inflation and economic growth. The prevalence of extremely poor quality managers who will not be able to manage the headwinds that they are going to face, including high interest costs but also the supply chain pressures that are present. There's a possibility that retail investors could be hurt. There's also the ongoing sub-factor of work from home, which is probably a more minor factor. Now, Carl Icahn has asserted that there are some ways of mitigating this. These include his general investment philosophy, which is to more take an activist investor role, 
whereby he'll go in to try to replace poor quality managers and get an uplift that way. You know, I, I, look, I look for these companies that are tremendously undervalued and where we can bring in activism and where we can get that big edge. And we just find companies that we feel are undervalued. Uh, like, for instance, now we're in a, a fight for SWX. It's a utility. Carl Icahn has also explicitly asserted that he engages in hedging and hedging away some of these market risks. Carl Icahn, therefore, is less likely to be affected by this, it seems. But I have kept everything hedged for the last few years. And um, I, I think now that we do have a, we, we, we have a, a strong hedge on against the long positions that we try to be activists in and get that edge. Now, his hedging approach is perhaps not apt to all investors because it can be extremely costly to hedge, particularly in volatile markets. However, it is a way of reducing exposure through proper risk management, and proper risk management is always good advice. It's just that his way of doing it is going to be expensive and seems to draw his portfolio close to the idea of alpha betting, whereby you're effectively trying to bet on a positive alpha and neutralize out the beta in your portfolio. That appears to be what he is getting at here, which is going to be an expensive practice for most investors, particularly retail investors. Still, these are his ideas on why a hard landing could quite possibly arise and why we are facing economic headwinds. Now, if you think I've missed anything, or if you think Carl Icahn is wrong or right, let me know that in the comments below. And otherwise, it would be great if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And hopefully, I will see you for future videos as well.